Welcome to the Only One Business Show with me, your host, James Nathan, chatting to some of the UK's leading business professionals, sharing tips, insights, and advice on how to create amazing customer experiences whilst building bigger, better, and more profitable businesses as a result. What can you do in your business today and in the years to come to truly delight your clients? What exceptional experiences can you give them to take away and cherish? How can you delight the most important person in the world? Satisfaction makes you one of many. Delighting clients makes you the only one. And you can't be just one. You have to be the only one. Hello and welcome to the Only One Business Show with me, your host, James Nathan. Now today I've got a really interesting guest for you and I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. She's massively established and focuses on talking about business sales and her inspirational journey from the Dragon's Den, winning on that show, to international sales coach working globally with entrepreneurs, SMEs and corporates. As an international sales coach, her live it, love it, sell it methodology is all about the human conversation and human connection, not the typical pushy, sleazy sales image that's kind of, well, hopefully in the past. Her story is absolutely inspiring and she leaves the audience feeling empowered and ready to make a big difference in what they're doing. Her book's available on Amazon as a bestseller and her opinions and outcomes and the missions that she tries to untrain from people who've been trained to sell, she takes extremely seriously. That's going to be interesting to find out more about. Please welcome Jules White. Jules, hi, how are you? I'm very well, James. Thank you so much for having me as one of your guests. Now, I'm really excited to talk to you today because I've spent my life talking about sales and the try to sort of remove the stigma of the the sleazy used car salesman kind of, and, and apologies to car salespeople, but you know, that kind of <laughs> horrible stereotype um, yeah. that you're, you're, um, you're making a way through that, that mire and helping people relearn. Yes, yes. Um, I think it's based on, well, it's definitely based on 32 years of being actually in sales and having worked in a, quite a few different sectors having worked in different positions in sales, you know, from knocking the doors to actually being a sales director. So you've got this really wonderful breadth and knowledge of sales across all of that time. And I started to look at it, James, and think, what was I trained to do back then? And I was continually trained in this process-driven way that was actually quite transactional. It was Mm -hmm. inhuman. And I thought, my goodness, if I start my own business and I'm going to do anything in sales, which I knew that was what I was passionate about, it couldn't be in that way. I had to do it in a different way. Why are people, are people still trained that? I was going to say, why do they do that? But are, yeah. are people still trained in that old fashioned process way? I still see it. I still hear about it. Um, and I think it's, I think it's changing which is the good news, Mm -hmm. but I I still think it's really slowly changing when it doesn't need to. And I think part of it is we're hanging on to that uh, process-driven way, you know, these methodologies that have become sacred in sales. Mm -hmm. And I think we're almost a bit scared to say they don't work anymore, you know, so there are still people out there teaching those structured methods Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm kind of wanting to untrain all of that, as as you mentioned earlier, and I want people to be human. I actually want them to appreciate they already have the skills. What I say is the life skills are sales skills mm-hmm. because they are uniquely them, and that's what I want people to start trusting, that they can actually just be themselves because that's what we buy. I um I spend a lot of time teaching people to sell, as you know too, but I don't mm. teach salespeople. I teach professional people to sell professional services um, and recruiters and that kind of thing. So uh, it's a different kind of um, starting point, I guess, but the process is the same. Mm. But how do you unteach somebody? <laughs> I think uh, it's actually – Bringing something into consciousness, if that makes sense, James. You know, Mm -hmm. we do a lot of stuff in that subconscious place, don't we? You know how we drive a car, for instance. Uh Um, My son the other day said to me, Mum, how do you drive a car? 
And do you know, I had to take about five minutes to think about what order to tell him that everything <laughs> came in. Honestly, because I hadn't brought it into that place. You know, I just did it. Yeah. So I think what's happened is when we have been trained to sell, we just do this stuff because it feels comfortable. Right. So it's about taking people out of their comfort zone and almost stripping them right back and saying, okay, What's great about you as a person? What are your core values? Mm -hmm. What do you love doing? How do you talk? What's your language? How would you meet a friend and have a cup of coffee? And when you get them into that kind of place, they start relaxing and just being them. That's mm -hmm. where I want to start with people to help them to sell. That's where I want to start them connecting with their customers. Fantastic. Let's. Can we step back in time a bit? Because you're a bit of a TV star, aren't you? <laughs> well, apparently so, James. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the Dragon's Den and how you ended up there and, and what you what you learned from that process. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously we're 2019 when we're recording this because this may be listened to in years to come, James. I hope so. Um, but, yeah, so do I. Um, but my Dragon's Den experience started in 2005, would you believe, right. which seems an awful long time ago. My son, Sam, was three months old when I right. started a business because I had fallen in love with having a baby and I started – a, a company called Truly Madly Baby selling baby products at Party Plan. Okay. So we used to just, I think women particularly used to love Party Plan. We'd buy anything as long as it was at a party. <laughs> so honestly, it's true. So I thought, well, no one's doing it with baby products. There must be a market here. So mm -hmm. I researched, I started a business. When I was about a couple of months further on, I'd got about six consultants I'd recruited across the country via mm -hmm. these little uh, forums, you know, net mums and mum's net because uh -huh. we didn't have the social media back then James right um, and then I saw this advert pop up for Dragon's Den on my computer half seven in the morning and I'd watched the first series so this was only the second series and I thought I loved that I loved how those uh, those poor entrepreneurs squirmed in front of those dragons <laughs> how amazing was that I'll apply <laughs> so, so I did I applied and within two weeks I was in front of the dragons filming pitching Quite Wow, as fast things. as that. Gee, okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I literally think sometimes in, in life it is about timing. Mm -hmm. And I literally think they were just on the last few people they wanted to finish a series and I just got in at the right time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that was there. And and I pitched, um, I mean, I don't know if you want to know the, who the dragons were back then. Is that of interest, oh, do you think? Oh, well, yeah, let's stretch our memories. Who can we remember from 2005? <laughs> Okay, so who did you watch it, James? I've always watched it. I love that show. Oh, it's um, okay. I, I think unfortunately it's becoming a bit more car crash telly than it used to be. I think totally originally agree. it was a lot more about good people on there trying to sell good stuff, and now they have a lot of that. This is personally my opinion, but I think they chuck in the odd weird one just to, for a bit of a laugh, which I think is a bit unfair. Yeah, I agree. So back then it was um, well, Peter, Deborah. Was Duncan Bannatyne in there too? Yeah. So I didn't have Deborah. Right. Um, I had Peter. I had uh, Duncan Bannatyne. I had um, Doug Richards. Do you remember him, the American oh, guy? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, he, he didn't know how to smile, just so you remember <laughs> who he was. Um, I had Rachel Elner. Right. Now, she was the Red Letters Days lady. Yes, yes. yes. Now, did Peter um, Jones buy Red Letter Days from her? Or did yeah. They, yeah. So, so here's an interesting thing. She was heavily pregnant. So I went up the stairs, just climbed the wooden stairs, and I thought, great, she's pregnant. She's going to buy into this. She's going to love it. Mm -hmm. But she was actually the day before, um, actually the next day, I should say, Peter and Theo Pafitis bought Red Letter Days for a pound each. Oh, goodness. So she was just about to go out of business when they actually did the filming. She knew it. Right. So she was never going to be my investor. And um, so Rachel, um, Doug Richards, Duncan Ballantyne, Theo Pafitis was the new kid on the block, uh -huh. and then Peter Jones. Great. And so you walk up the stairs, you stand in front of all those people, you pitch Truly Madly Baby. And do you know, when you when you started telling me this story, I think of, you know, I don't think there's been a mum ever who's had a baby and hasn't thought, oh, I could make a baby business. <laughs> um, you know, no one's ever thought of it before. <laughs> Off I go, but you did it and you you know, obviously build a great business. Did anybody yeah. buy you? 
Yeah, so on the day, we, uh, I was in front of the Dragons for two and a half hours. And I always have to tell you this bit because you only saw 14 minutes on the program. Uh-huh. I was obviously so much better in my two and a half hours than they showed in the 14 minutes. <laughs> They cut it beautifully. But yeah, Yeah. Theo and Peter were pitching against each other to invest in the business, which was just a dream come true because they bought the percentage down without me doing any negotiation. So Great. And then I shook hands with Peter. I shook hands with Peter on the show. Um, That was the May that we recorded Mm -hmm. it. And then by September was the first time I heard from his people, which was a contract that my solicitor begged me not to sign. Right. Gosh, that's a long time. So it took two weeks to get you on the telly. Yeah. And months to send your contract, which you then didn't sign. Yeah, because as well, the hard bit was I was in limbo because I couldn't tell anyone I'd been on the den because it mm. hadn't been shown. Yeah. So it's top secret. And also, what did I do with my business? Well, I, I kind of just had to carry on running it organically. Yeah. Um, so it was quite a funny time, actually. But um, I, I cracked on, as you do. And then we didn't sign. And then we were on the television at the end of October. We were shown on the BBC. Right. Um, obviously, as Dragon's Den investment winners, shaking hands with Peter. And then that evening, I got two and a half thousand emails pop into my inbox, mm-hmm. and uh, about three of them were from investors. And I chose one lady who I knew. I played hockey with her, mm-hmm. and she became my new investor. Fantastic! I always wonder what happens when it goes to air because the first thing you know, I sit there with Mandy and we watch it, <laughs> watch it a lot, and you know, there's something's on there that's quite cool. And, oh, and and nip online and see you know if it's available and what it costs and what have you. And I'm sure that sales bubble must really give some of the businesses a real leg up. Oh, it does. And the thing is, you have to be, well, back then we had to be smart because we had things like bandwidth to consider with websites. Mm -hmm. So most of the sites you went to that were on Dragon's Den, they just crashed because they couldn't manage all the people (laughs) who were logging in. Well, my ex-husband, yeah, he's ex now, but at the time he was my husband, he actually was a bit smart and he bought extra bandwidth so that people could still get onto our website. So so that was a really smart move, to be honest. Wow, stuff you don't think about anymore in the in the fiber world exactly exactly so those were the days james weren't they oh yeah i i, I talk about them <laughs> and i feel like a fossil i was talking about fax machines the other day jules and yeah. you know then you start thinking what what on earth um but they the kids look at you or my kids look at me and say yeah we're radio whatever yeah <laughs> Into their funny, screen with their instant everything what um yeah. what did you learn from that experience though because it's a hell of a thing to go through yeah, I mean, I think it was all, it all happened really quick. I think that's the big thing to say. So it's quite a blur. You know, imagine I'd only just had a baby as well. So yeah, there was yeah. a lot of stuff going on. But actually, three years on from being on the den, we, we were a million pound turnover business with profit. Wow. I had 432 consultants across the country from, from the Hebrides down to Guernsey. Um, and I had inquiries from America and Australia to come into the, the sort of truly madly baby um, bubble as it were. Um, So it was a massive success. What I learned was this, James, we hadn't done any of the foundation work to set up that business. So when it became so successful so quickly, we couldn't manage it. We couldn't handle the amount of orders. We didn't have enough stock. We didn't have enough staff and we didn't have the systems. Right, to manage everything, right. which was really, really critical because then cash flow came into play, which meant that actually my investor who um, I took on board, who hadn't really done the things I was hoping she'd do in some ways, then says, I can invest the next level of investment. That's mm-hmm. not a problem, but I want 75% of your business. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And bearing in mind, she'd had, I think, about 42% was the deal I did with her following Mm -hmm. the den. Um, And I just, you know, my TEDx talk, James talks about, we always have a choice. And actually, at that point, my choice was absolutely not. (laughs) I'm not giving you 75% of my business when I've worked so hard, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, working like 21 hours a day, seven days a week, which I pretty much had. And she took me into administration. So she closed me down and uh, the next day she brought the company back and she continued to run it as Truly Madly Baby. Do you know, I, I, I've i heard you talk about that before and it saddens me to this day to think that somebody could be so dreadful um, mm-hmm. to another person, but it happens in yeah. business and we shrug it off as, well, that's just business, but it's not just business. 
that's someone's yeah. livelihood, someone's existence, someone's you know business baby. Um, I know yeah. that you talk a lot about the humanity of sales and the connection between people. I guess that's uh, there's a there's a good starting point there, really, to to think about why don't people consider the human side of business? I think um, I, I'm guessing that some of it is based on maybe what they've always had, how they've been brought up, what they expect of life. And I just think sometimes people just think they can just have, if they want it, they can have, mm-hmm. um, have it. And and I think that's what this was about. I think there was an element of jealousy and I think there was an element of, I just want this for myself because it's successful. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, she had the money. She had the money to do that, which was the power. And I didn't. I tried to find an investor to buy her out, mm-hmm. but I just ran out of time. Um, and ultimately, I lost everything. I mean, I really did. My, my next couple of years were were loss after loss on a personal level and obviously on the business level. So that was a massive learning curve for me. Oh, I'm sure. And so talk, tell me about the, the essence of live it, love it, sell it. Yeah, so... Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I started this business, so I, I worked for people for, for some years, James, after losing my business, mm-hmm. I kind of went back into corporate, right. built more experience in sales, did head of sales roles, sales director roles, which is great because then I had this breadth of experience. And 2017, I was working for a company and they just really couldn't support me anymore in terms of my salary, I think, and what I was doing for them. They made me redundant. Mm -hmm. I had three months money and the decision was, do I carry on working in corporate for other people or or do I just go and start a business again? And in all honesty, I knew I was that entrepreneur at heart. So I thought, I'll do sales because I know I love it. Mm -hmm. But if I do it, I've got to create it in a different way. And so that's when I came up with Live It, Love It, Sell It because I felt it needed to be much more human. I felt live it it's, it's what I call the sales road trip James right so live it is about the mindset and this is about are you fit to travel on the sales road trip because okay. I think for so so many people entrepreneurs and people working in sales we don't usually tap into the mindset of it all and the psychology of sales and I think it's massive so that's where I start mm-hmm. I then look at love it this is planning your route so I have all these fabulous analogies um this is about The whys. Why do I do what I do? So why does my business do this? Why does my customer want to buy it? And how do we then connect the two together? So we do lots of work on ideal client, actually emotional side of of sales, because for me, emotion is where we connect as as humans. And so I will buy very emotionally. And most of us do buy in an emotional way because the limbic brain Mm -hmm. is the first thing that starts to kick in. So the limbic brain which doesn't understand logic or language, it's actually driven completely on emotion, which is your gut. Sure. And that's really the first part of the brain that kicks in when you meet people or when you decide to buy something. So I want to really kick into the emotional side of how we buy mm. and also how we sell. So that's the love it part. Right. And then the sell it is about going on the journey. Mm-hmm. So actually reaching the destination. This is all about how you then go out with your message, get visible, get curious, ask questions, and obviously get helping. Because I believe sales is about helping people well i absolutely agree with you and if you can get into the situation where you can help someone make a good decision buy something that works for them whether it's a service or a product everyone walks away happy you've you've got a great business if you you know we talk a lot about the difference between manipulation and negotiation and, and and influence and you know at the end of the day um if you run with a strong moral compass and you help people make good decisions you're a good salesperson. I agree. I think one of the biggest things I see time and time again in in both how we train sales and how we actually sell is that I don't believe we spend enough time stepping into the world of the buyer. So we assume an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I've talked about this quite a lot lately in my posts about how much we assume. I mean, in life as well as obviously in business. Mm -hmm. And it's ridiculous how much we assume. Um, And we're almost taught to assume in some of the old sales methods assume this customer is ready to buy at this point, Mm -hmm. assume this customer wants what we've got to sell. But actually, if we start to turn it around and say, what's it like in your world? 
And actually, why why would you want to buy what I've got? Tell me how it's going to help you. You know, instead of telling them how it's going to help them, ask them how they think what I've got will help them. It's massively powerful. Oh, you know, when you're talking there about um, making assumptions, it points to the sales. Because I was thinking about assumptive closes and all that sort of stuff that used to be yeah. taught, and you just think, really? But I've heard yeah. lots of people do it. And uh, if you're assuming things, you're mind reading. If you're mind reading, you're not listening. If you're not listening, mm-hmm. you're not understanding. And if you're not understanding, you don't know your client well enough to sell them anything. Um, yeah. But it's still a it's still a big thing that people do. They get to those, you know, where are the buying signals? And I know we all talk about buying signals, but we talk about them. Yeah. I think we should talk about them as as indicators of another question, rather mm. than here we go. It's time to sell. Time to time to close. Time to close. Get on with it. A bit, exactly. um, you know, Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross. If you've seen that movie, yes, yes, and I think if I could actually ban the word close yep. or closing in that whole sales process, then I would because I just think it's, everything is wrong about that word. Because you know, ultimately, when you start to sell to somebody and, and they say yes, I'd like to do business, you're not closing and end, ending anything. You're starting a relationship, you mm-hmm. know. So, um, so closing for me is one of those little trigger words that I don't particularly like anyway. I really like that mindset. I really love that mindset around it at the start of a relationship. Yeah. I really firmly believe, and I don't know if I see what you think, Jules, that closing techniques do one thing. They sell books for people who want to sell books. Yeah. I don't think they help people in sales in any way. And they make up, no. you know, there's some really lovely, funny stories about puppy dogs and things. But otherwise, it's just about <laughs> yeah. it's just about salespeople selling books to uh, to make a bit of money on the side. You mentioned why there, and I've had a lot of conversations on this podcast in the past about you know finding people's why and whether it's it's a good thing or or a, a not a good thing. What do you think around? How do you help people find out why they do what they do? I think why is about being really honest about why you are truly doing what you do. Um, and actually, my my really fabulous Simon Sinek, if you follow him, mm-hmm. I think he's the guy who sums this up really well. So he says about the why being not what your exit strategy is, not how much money you're going to make, but actually your beliefs, mm-hmm. your purpose okay. and your values. And so this is going much deeper. This is about what are my real core values in life? So, you know, I've got integrity and I, there's lots of things where courage, you know, there's lots of things that I have as values. Mm -hmm. And I see those as the why in my business, because the, my why is my whole journey to when I started this business and the reason why I want to pass on that knowledge to the people I pass it on to. That's not to get rich. That's actually so that I help them to understand how amazing sales really is. Why? How? I was going to say, why don't they know their why? (laughs) (laughs) No, why don't they? Why don't people get that? Is it is it that they don't spend time thinking about it, or is it is it just not important to them at a certain point of their of their journey? I think they don't spend the time to think about it. It's like anything, isn't it? It's bringing it into that that conscious place, like we were saying earlier. you just become so much more connected to your uh, ideal customers and clients Mm -hmm. when you understand your why, because guess what? They'll have the same core values as you. We're attracted to that as humans. Mm -hmm. So if you've really nailed, you know, here's my core values. This is why I'm running my business. This is why do I want to help people? Well, because of this, you know, and it's usually based on a past experience based on some pain you may have experienced that you don't really want everyone else to experience. You know, it's that sort of stuff usually. Okay. They know they know what that is. And if that story is coming through in a really vulnerable and authentic way, then your ideal clients will will connect to it because they've got the same values. They they resonate with it. Mm-hmm. And guess what happens then? They trust you. Oh my goodness. That's why we buy, because people buy people they trust. Ultimately, it's uh, it's it, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great books around trust, but it is the currency, isn't it? The sales currency. Yeah, I think so. I think so because it's just a human instinct. We can't just we don't just pretend it. We don't just say, oh yeah, I better I better make sure I trust them. 
we don't even think like that. Mm-hmm. We just have to. It's fight or flight territory. Um, and we just need to trust people. We know whether it feels right or not, James. We just do when we meet people, don't we? You must you must feel that yourself when you meet people. I think we get a feeling of whether we feel we can trust them. Yes. Um, trust yeah. itself takes a lot longer to establish. And I also think that sales and trust go hand in hand at certain levels. There's a level of sales which it doesn't matter. You know, if I'm going to buy a, pa- a pack of bubble gum, it doesn't really matter to me what it's all about the price right. and the availability. But for anything of reasonable value, then it's a vitally important thing. Jules, I was reading, I so- so. I was reading something of yours recently which said that, um, that everybody's a natural salesperson. And I've spent my mm-hmm. life saying there's no such thing as a natural salesperson. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I just mean that actually from the minute we were born, we were selling in essence because we were surviving and we were communicating and we were connecting. And I just see sales as that. And I think we've, over the years, we have been very clever in putting people in boxes. So we say people are introvert or we say they're extrovert. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I agree, we're all different and we're all unique. But I don't think it rules out any of those people that they could connect and make a relationship. So for me, sales is about making a relationship. Now, that doesn't mean to say that everyone is going to have a job in sales, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying because everybody won't want a job in sales. But if somebody says to me, I can't sell, I would say to them, yes, you can. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think so, that it, and, and we we are actually coming to the same point with that because my my theory is that you know that sales is something that can be learned and taught, and it is not naturally it's not something that people can are naturally good at. Not everybody's naturally good at, but everyone can learn. Um, was it Brian Tracy that talked about the the, the kid with the ice cream? Um, and selling, you know, selling the, the, from the very beginning, wanting an ice cream from his dad. I, you know, that everyone yeah. has that ability in themselves to, to, to get what they want if they know the right triggers to push. Yeah, exactly. But I also think that we don't trust our own selves enough. We, we think that it's something really super special to sell. Mm-hmm. But actually, we know how to listen. We know how to ask questions. And we know how to speak. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, these are actually the real bare essentials of us creating a relationship. When when you've done the close, which we're not going to call a close anymore, we're going to call the start <laughs> of a relationship going on. What do people? What are the good things that people could be doing next? Once you've actually got a relationship and you know you've got the business, mm-hmm. what are the next things? Yeah. Well, I th- do you know, I think one of the massive things is to just continue that relationship. So sometimes we- it's very easy for us to sit back, isn't it? Oh, we've got it now. Great. We've got it signed. Mm-hmm. <sighs> you know. But actually, this is, the, this is the start of the relationship, as I mentioned. This is now where we can really start to get to know them. Mm-hmm. So if you are working in a company, build new connections in that company. Who else do we know in that company? And then actually, what's the next thing we can do to help them? Yes, we're going to fulfill this contract on this subject. Mm-hmm. But then how else do we make that the bigger picture of working with us? What else can we add? Va- where else can we add value? You know, it's that, isn't it? It's just continuing to build and grow that relationship and get I like to get really ingrained into a client Mm -hmm. so I'm almost part of the team so I really get to know their culture and their mission and their vision Mm -hmm. you know because then I can train alongside that I'm not sure how you could do it without knowing those things or do it well enough I don't think you can but that's you and I are just very aligned with that sort of stuff but people I think if they're too structured, again, this this goes back to those old sales methods where we were just teaching the process, the transaction, and the structure. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm much more about connection and and understanding that core the core value of the business. For me, James, that's why I love SME business because it's usually started by an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You know, they've usually got some sort of passion coming through. The core values are usually ingrained through the business. Yep. You know, and you can work with that. You can work so beautifully with that because that keeps the message consistent. Then, when you're ter- when you're when you're selling, what's the one thing then, Jules? What's the one big thing, the the golden nugget that you'd love to leave people with, the listeners today, that they can do in their businesses today or in the years to come to make their true business truly better? 
Well, I, you're probably not going to expect me saying this, but maybe you are. But I, I think you need to just be authentic in your business. Don't try and be something you're not. Don't try and make it too complicated. Keep it simple. Be you. Understand that why, that, that core value as to why you're doing what you do. And then everything you do, keep it consistent so people just recognize you and they know who you are and what you stand for. It's massive. It just goes, the ripple effect is huge. Jules, that's absolutely fantastic. What a great thought to leave with. Thank you so, so much for taking your time out today. It's been great to talk to you. And you. I hope you really enjoyed this episode of the Only One Business Show, and I look forward to sharing your company again very soon. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so wherever you pick up your podcasts. And in the meantime, have a great day. Bye for now. Thank you.